Good morning. I'm Katherine Rafelson, and I'm the president of SID Washington. And because we have some Department of Defense and military people here, I feel compelled to start precisely on time. I'm delighted to welcome you to our 2018 annual conference. Our theme this year is the future of development in a rapidly changing world. We're going to have many sessions throughout the day that touch on this theme from different perspectives. Beginning with our discussion this morning on diplomacy, development, and defense, and how the lines are blurring between the three as they increasingly need to cooperate and work together. We'll talk about globalization in our breakout panels, a topic that is clearly being affected by changes around the world, and the development professional of the future as we think about the skills and mindsets we will all need in order to address these changes. Our lunchtime plenary will focus on the increasing impact of development in the national security equation. Then in the afternoon, our breakout panels will look at innovation as well as new models driven by the private sector, in both cases reacting to and initiating change. Finally, at the end of the day, we'll have a plenary discussion with senior staff from the House Foreign Affairs and Senate Foreign Relations Committees Again, looking at what has changed, changes going forward, and how these changes affect all of us from the perspectives of the Hill. Some of the organizations most adept at coping with change and thriving as a result of it are our sponsors. The many organizations in this room that have made today's conference possible. We are very grateful to all of you. We'd particularly like to acknowledge three leaders in our rapidly changing world, our diamond sponsors, Apt Associates, Arizona State University, and Tetra Tech. And we have a very short video from each. Millions of people die every year from drinking dirty water. You either let it wash over you, or you can do something about it. So I did. I would never have felt like I had the ability to do something without ASU pushing me. So we started going there, to the places that need us the most. We 
built filtration systems out of local materials with the people. To see those kids drink clean water for the first time, it's the most rewarding feeling that you can ever have. I went to ASU because I wanted to change the world. The thing I never would have expected is how the world would have changed me. We are losing 80,000 acres of tropical rainforest daily and 135 plant, animal, insect species. Uh, carbon dioxide is the highest it's been in over 650 years and global temperatures have increased uh, about a degree and a half or a little more since 1880. My name is Leif Kenberg. I'm an associate in the environment and natural resources sector at Tetra Tech. I'm inspired by biodiversity ecology. Uh, there are fascinating areas that uh, are endlessly available for exploration. Um, I've been doing that since I was very young uh, and really value our environment. Um, I'm also inspired by the people and the diversity of my colleagues, their backgrounds and experiences that they bring to this work and passion that they bring to this work as well. Here at Tetra Tech, I've had the opportunity to help Dominicans, Malawians, Tanzanians, and others better understand the vulnerability of their water and other natural resources to these changes, as well as opportunities to become more resilient in the face of a warming, changing climate. I've had the opportunity to work with Liberians to develop management plans for thousands of hectares of forests, and hopefully empowering the next generation of those Liberians to maintain those forests. I I've been thinking about why I got into environment and natural resources work, kind of where, where that inspiration started. And I, I think one of the pivotal moments was uh, when I was uh, about nine years old, I entered an Earth Day poster competition in my rural county. That poster, if I recall correctly, had the slogan, keep the earth clean and the trees will stay green and a nice landscape and a river. And I think that might have been about the time where I, I started realizing that stewardship of our environment and, and our natural resources uh, was bigger than what I was aware of at that time and bigger than the rural small the farm that I grew up on. What I like about working at Tetra Tech is that we recognize that young people are the future stewards of our natural resources and we look to tap into whatever motivates those young people to do better and steward those resources. I think the current and future generations care about our environment. It's integral and critical to so much of what we do that I'm very positive about the future and where we're headed. And I think the work we're doing here at Tetra Tech is contributing to that. Thank you, APT Associates, Arizona State University, and Tetra Tech, and thank you to all of our sponsors of today's conference. I would now like to introduce Sid Washington's board chair, Melissa Logan, to tell you about this morning's keynote session. Good morning, everyone. This is a huge crowd, and you all came before 8.45 in the morning. That is very impressive to see this many people. Um, I think, uh, according to our registration data, we have over 800 people registered for our conference this year, making it one of the largest um, and most diverse conferences that we've ever had. We have individuals from a number of different countries and from across the United States that have uh, come here today to talk about the topics that are so important to us in advancing our shared interest in international development. So welcome, everyone, to our conference. Before I introduce our moderator and opening keynote discussions, I wanted to take a few minutes to give you an overview of this year's conference. In response to feedback we received through, from this entire community through our annual member satisfaction and 
uh, perception survey, this year we've intentionally brought in new and different perspectives from experts in defense, security, technology, commerce, and diplomacy. These voices, we hope, will take us outside the development echo chamber into adjacent fields that hold promise for us in helping us to advance equitable development. We've also deliberately structured the day to examine both policy and practice within the context of globalization, political polarization, and an unprecedented acceleration of change across the world. This conference would not have been possible without the vision and leadership of Sue Tadakowitz, Sid Washington board member, chair of the annual conference, and president and CEO of Nathan Associates. Sue, the annual conference planning committee, Catherine Rafelson, our president, and the Sid Washington team put in countless hours to develop the agenda, secure amazing speakers, and create a rich space for dialogue. Please join me in thanking Sue, Catherine, and their teams on this incredible effort. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the moderator of our keynote discussion, Ms. Amanda Dory. Ms. Dory, who currently serves as Associate Dean for Outreach and Research at the National War College, is going to kick off our day with a discussion between leaders from USAID, the Department of Defense, and the State Department on how diplomacy, development, and defense can and should work together. Prior to serving at the War College, during her illustrious career at the Department of Defense, Ms. Dory led long-term trend analysis and strategy development for the Office of the Secretary. She also served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for African Affairs. In these roles, among others, Ms. Dory has emphasized the need for partnership, good governance, public participation, and economic growth to deal with transnational and transregional threats. She has witnessed firsthand the effect of globalization on ideas, economies, and cultural practices, and how the speed of change and ease of communication can exacerbate ethnic strife and poverty and destabilize governments. Through this discussion, she will explore with the panelists how the development community can effectively collaborate and coordinate with other national security pillars to positively shape our global future. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Dory, who will introduce our other panelists. Good morning. Can you hear me in the back? You have us nicely mic'd up. These chairs are as comfortable as they look from afar, just to let you know. I think you'll <laughs> maybe want to cycle through in the course of the day after you sit in those ballroom chairs for hour after hour. Uh, as you can see, we're missing Ambassador Satterfield, who is stuck in traffic. This is uh, a Washington phenomenon, as you experience probably yourselves most days. So we'll welcome him as he arrives, but we'll go ahead and get started with uh, our other two distinguished guests. We have uh, the USAID counselor, who is known to many, many in this room, Tom Stahl, who's with us as uh, the development D. We have Mr. Mark Swain, who's the acting deputy assistant secretary of defense for stability and humanitarian affairs in the office of the secretary of defense. Uh, representing the Defense D, and then our, our Diplomatic D will, will be here shortly, or in the fullness of time. Uh, I just wanted to say I'm very inspired looking at the audience this morning of development practitioners filling this room. And I think of the, the work that you do, and I think of Sisyphus at times, and this idea of rolling the boulder up the hill, and then at times, whether it's conflict or a natural disaster or population growth, some, something happens and, and sends it back down the, the hill. Uh, but you stand up and, and start moving it back 
back again. And I think that is, um, on the one hand, it can have a depressing feel to it, but it recalled to me as well the, the uh, work by Albert Camus, who talked about the idea of, can you imagine Sisyphus happy? And part of his theme there was this idea that it's, it's the journey, it's the sense of purpose uh, that is inspiring and, and continues to inspire people to move forward in difficult circumstances and in difficult places. And it occurred to me that that, that sense of purpose or, or sense of mission, as we would say in Department of Defense, is the, the glue that binds together the, the three Ds the sense of mission, the sense of purpose that, that you kind of pick yourself up when, when things don't go well and, and you continue to move forward. So I, again, I just wanted to acknowledge the development practitioners here in the room this morning and the critical work that you do and the, the uh, kind of unsung hero aspect to all of that. In terms of a, a um, framework for the conversation this morning, I wanted to think about both continuity and change on, on the spectrum of life and how we're experiencing that in terms of the, the current times here in the United States, how we're tackling challenges uh, across the board. Some of them uh, look similar and some of them look new in terms of different hybrid circumstances. And so I wanted to, with the distinguished panelists, have some conversations about what's, what's new and, and what's different. I think from a DOD perspective, there is a lot of continuity when we think about 17 years of conflict now, our longest conflict uh, historically with respect to Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, this has become almost an enduring feature to the extent that at the National War College we have case studies where we're exploring the decision making at various points and, and trying to assess uh, what, what those conflicts look like. So tr tremendous continuity in, in some places, but then a lot of change, of course. And we're, we're now on our, our third president and our third administration dealing not only with the, the challenges of Iraq and Afghanistan, but in terms of U.S. foreign policy, national security policy, approaches to development. So change uh, with each administration, clearly change reacting to circumstances on, on the ground. So I wanted to start off uh, with, the, with the panelists, maybe I'll start with, with Tom, to ask how, how you see from a USAID perspective in the first instance, uh, places of continuity and places of change when you're thinking about the AID mission. And then I'll ask the other two panelists to do the same. Thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, it's great to uh, be here with you all. I'd say it's good to see you, but with the light, it's hard to see. But uh, I know uh, many friends here and many supporters and, and many of our partners who are actually the ones doing the work in the field. Uh, that uh, When I say USAID did this and that, it's actually a lot of you who are doing the work. And we really appreciate the partnership we have with so many of you uh, out there, and, and uh, it's great. Uh, there has been a lot of continuity. Certainly, USA has been around for uh, many, many years. We were established in 1961. Uh, our strength has always been to work in the local communities, understanding the, the core needs, uh, the context that we're working within. Are you Try this. Thank you very much. Um, you know, so that continuity of coordination certainly with State Department has been there and, and continues to be there. And it's interesting when we talk about the the three Ds: uh, defense, diplomacy, and development. That was first coined in the National Security Strategy in 2002 under uh, President Bush, actually before we went into Iraq. So we we think of it as post Iraq and Afghanistan, but it was actually first established that, that the core of our security as a nation depends on those three pillars, defense, diplomacy, and development. And, and that has evolved over time. But I have to say, when I first looked at, uh, you know, going out to Iraq in 2003, shortly after uh, the invasion there, 
most of my USAID colleagues saying, are you crazy? We try to stay away from the Defense Department and anything to do with uh, the, you know, war and, uh, and conflict. Uh, and so I, I got a lot of pushback from my own colleagues when I went out to Iraq. And then uh, when I came back and I went to the War College as a student in 2004, uh, most of the U.S., the, the Defense Department colleagues that I talked to, they were like, USAID, is that an NGO? Uh, they didn't really know much about USAID, okay? But then when I went back as an instructor at the War College, like Amanda is now, uh, everybody had heard of USAID, and we, our, our work had evolved to the point where we were working much more closely with the Defense Department as well as State Department. And in fact, now we've set up an Office of Civ Mill Coordination. We have uh, senior development advisors at all the geographic combatant commands. We have representatives from those commands and the Pentagon within USAID, and we work much more closely. So while there's been continuity, there has been uh, quite significant evolution of uh, how we work together, especially with the uh, Defense Department and, of course, increasingly with the, with, uh, with the uh, State Department. And it's interesting to note that while, uh, like at the National Security Council, USAID has always been involved in one way or another, but actually that's been elevated over time. And under this administration, it was the first time that it was specifically stated that the administrator of USAID sits on the deputies committee officially and in fact is usually and certainly quite often invited to the principals committee. So we're there at the table, uh, you know, at the highest level and we were certainly very much involved in the drafting of the national security strategy that we have today. So, thank you. Very good, thank you. I'll, I'll turn to Mark next and, and obviously we are welcoming and greeting Ambassador Satterfield. The, the, theme that we've started with, Ambassador, is this idea of continuity and, and change and how each of the Ds is experiencing it as a, a department or agency. Mark. Uh, thanks very much, and uh, hopefully some of the folks are uh, Caps fans in the audience because that was a great game last night that uh, they, uh, for ice hockey. For those of you who don't follow that, the Washington Capitals uh, won a game in Las Vegas. It was great. So, All right. It's always good to start off with an applause because <laughs> of nothing that I have done. Um, I would say to, to answer Amanda's question about some of the things that have changed between the three different agencies in my perspective, and one of the greatest and positive changes in the last few years um, is that in every combatant command, in all of the combatant commands, we have a, a POLAD, a political ad advisor from the State Department. We've had that for years. But now there are lots of commands have deputy civilian uh, commanders. So you have a four-star commander, and there's lots of commands that have deputy commanders who are State Department uh, senior foreign service officers who bring their State Department expertise, but they're fulfilling a Department of Defense job as a, as a deputy commander. And I think that's extremely valuable, especially on many things that DOD does because everyone thinks about all of the war fighting parts of the Department of Defense, and that is our core competency and the most important part of uh, our business. But there's also a part of DOD that we need to support others. In the, the military lexicon, we say supported and support team commander. And on many issues in our government, we are the support team commander to the State Department. And having a deputy commander uh, from the State Department is extremely valuable. And in the last few years, commands have also had USAID development advisors. And again, critical, critical, important to have that level of expertise that has the ear of the commander because as the combatant commander, if it's talking about South America, Africa, in uh, Central uh, Asia, in uh, Central Command, in the Middle East, having somebody who can talk to the commander and explain what the other elements of our national government are doing, I think, are extremely uh, important areas and issues. Um, also, um, some of the cooperation areas that I've seen in the last few years here in D.C., um, almost every meeting that I go to, 
but we have DOD, state, and aid, the core three Ds, <clears throat> discussing the major topics, no matter what the topic is, no matter what region I'm in, I can be guaranteed that we are going to be working with state and aid counterparts hand in hand, developing that policy. And it says it right in the introduction of the national security strategy that the U.S. consolidation consolidates its military victories with political, which is the state and economic triumphs, um, bill and market economies and fair trade democratic principles and shared security partnerships. So again, um, just from the top of our national security strategy tells us that we need to uh, work together and I think that uh, we're doing that more and more um, each year. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Ambassador Satterfield. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to open by uh, perhaps making a counterintuitive statement, let's go blues uh, <laughs> next year, uh, <laughs> not, not this. Uh, this week I mark uh, my 39th year uh, in government. And so I look back over four decades of work with the defense community, with the uh, international assistance community, both NGO and governmental as well as, of course, our diplomatic uh, efforts all focused in the Middle East. And as we look at continuity and change, uh, there's been reference made to Iraq. And Iraq was, um, in many ways, uh, both a searing experience for the international uh, and U.S. policy community, but it was also a transformative uh, experience as well. And I'd like to talk a little bit about what came out of the Iraq uh, period, uh, 2003, to 2008 in terms of how international development and coordination, consultation, integration between the three Ds has gone since those moments. Preceding Iraq, the history of aid and international development work uh, tended to be along classic lines of brick and mortar projects, heavy emphasis upon branding, uh, a clear desire to see um, outputs, quantifiable achievements, health clinics built, schools built, uh, physical structures rehabilitated, equipped, staffed, and put into operation. In Iraq, that focus upon bricks and mortar construction, upon outputs, quantifiable achievements, uh, really achieved either its apex or its nadir depending upon your point of view. The emphasis upon building things, whether the things were sustainable, staffable, indeed met a community-based desire or were done simply in order to meet goals set on an endless series of stoplight charts, all of that was suspended. There was, it seemed, infinite funding infinite personnel availability, both shoes and boots on the ground. And by simply doing enough things, we could transform Iraq into something that really didn't resemble what Iraq had been ever in its history. It, of course, did not work. It didn't work in spectacular fashion. Things that were built collapsed, weren't staffable, weren't manageable, were sinkholes for vast sums of money, not quite the seven trillion that is often cited, but more than enough to raise serious questions about was this the way an output-focused uh, international development piece of the three Ds, was this the way it was supposed to run? The answer, of course, was no. And out of that Iraq experience came something very different and something, in my view, very positive. It was a much tighter focus upon the distinction between outputs, specific quantifiable achievements, X tonnage of goods moved, Y playgrounds rehabilitated, Z schools built, to something else, outcomes. What were the US strategic outcomes desired in any particular case, big or small, Middle East, Africa, Asia, elsewhere. What were the benchmarks that we felt were meaningful in determining whether we were making progress on those outcomes? What kinds of inputs, money, boots, shoes, political influence did we need to affect the outcomes? 
What was the role of development? What was the role of diplomacy? What was the role of defense and military strategy and at times kinetic activity in getting there? It's classic RAND systems analysis. And if it's applied rigorously, it actually does work. It's amazing. We're all really, really good. Everybody in this room, everybody in government at measuring what we put in and measuring the physical things we put out. We're great at that because it's quantifiable. We get real hazy, real foggy on the outcomes, but it's the outcomes that are the most important. I think today, coming out of the experience of Iraq, the idea of outcome-focused development projects, development assistance, the idea of development as well as diplomacy as absolutely essential support pillars for defense activities has never been greater the cohesiveness, coherency, sensibleness of how we together act has never been greater than today. And one can look only at the three salient examples of Iraq, Syria, particularly northern Syria, and Afghanistan to see that in practice. In Iraq and in Syria, as we worked to defeat ISIS, the physical uh, ground structure of the so-called caliphate, Development assistance played an absolutely vital part, not just in helping to undo the damage inflicted by ISIS and by the campaign to displace ISIS, but in the kind of stabilization absolutely required to prevent the reemergence of a physical threat, to prevent the return of the kind of destabilizing circumstances which made those grounds so fertile for ISIS or in the case of Afghanistan uh, for the other foes we are fighting to emerge. Nowhere and at no time has development assistance been as critical a security tool or as carefully applied as over the course of the last four years in these three areas. And that is a product of the close physical integration of development assistance professionals, diplomatic staff, with their colleagues in and out of uniform from the military services, from the Department of Defense, both here in Washington, at the combatant commands, and absolutely present in the field. Can you do this? Can you achieve this kind of physical integration, the shoes on ground part in combat zones? Absolutely you can. And here's another area where I think we all can take great pride in achievement. The overhead requirements of what we do in difficult places around the world, the number of people, the number of staff, the number of contractors we rely upon has dropped dramatically since the 80s, the 90s, the first decade of this century and since Iraq. We are doing far more, far better and more efficiently with far less investment in overhead. In Syria, we have only 12 State Department officers working all of the development assistance programs throughout the northern part of that country. Most are co-located with the combatant command elements in northeast Syria. Some are located in Turkey, and they're able to do the job. We don't count anymore, as we did in Iraq's very bad days, the number of boots on ground as a measure of success nor do we count the number of shoes on ground as a measure of success. It's outcomes. That's what matters. We've grown. We've grown smarter. We've grown more effective and efficient. We have to be. It's not just the circumstances in those areas where we're working that absolutely require that kind of rigorous efficiencies of personnel, efficiencies of application of treasure. It's the domestic constituencies. The United States, like many of our coalition partners around the world, are sick of forever wars, are sick of forever waste and expenditure of treasure, want to see the returns on their taxpayers' dollars, not unique to the United States at all. The more we can show we are achieving demonstrable outcomes with minimal and defensible amounts of expenditure and minimal and defensible presence of personnel the better we're going to be able to sustain these programs and projects. And I think, again, in Afghanistan, in northern Iraq, 
and in northern Syria were meeting those tests. The tests never stop. You never completely passed, nor should you. They're applied constantly. But I have never seen a moment in my 40 years when this 3D integration has been as effective, as successful, and as pragmatic and practically driven as it is today. And I think that is exceedingly encouraging as we look at the future, because you know resources aren't going to increase. They're going to at best stay the same, if not diminish. The criticisms and critiques rightfully applied to expenditures, to personnel deployments, aren't going to go away. They're going to be sustained, and they should be. And all of us need to be prepared to meet those challenges in a realistic, coherent fashion for the future. Ambassador, thank you. That's wonderful to have the breadth of time where you're able to observe these dynamics because sometimes what, what looks you know, problematic up close with a six-month lens, when you look at it with a five-year lens or a 10-year lens or a 39-year lens, uh, it, it looks a lot better. So it does <laughs> thank you for that. What I'd like to do is, um, this has come up a little bit, but just to, to really put a fine point on this issue of interagency coordination and how that works here in Washington and how that works out there on the ground somewhere or in, in the field. And, and just to be precise about this issue that has come up a little bit where Department of Defense, based on its scale, has a, a layer that the other two Ds don't, don't have and some of the structures that have been evolving to be able to deal with that. So within DOD, obviously, a Washington-based presence and, and interagency engagements, but then we have the combatant commands who are responsible for operations out there in the field, but, but who are not the on the ground, um, boot, boots on the ground, they're the controlling headquarters. And, and so this layer is different for Department of Defense, and I think it's clear probably to many in, in the room, but just to for, for those who may not be familiar with it, the, the DOD has three different layers that are operating. State Department and AID each have two based on a, a different scale, and those two layers are, are stretching at times to, to be able to interface with all of the DOD interlocutors who are available to, to uh, engage with. But let me, let me start at the end with Mark, and then we'll work our way in this direction. And first, I'll, I'll ask about the interagency, the Washington-based coordination, what, what is new and different, what's working well, where, where there's still challenges, and then we'll shift and talk about what that looks like out, out in the field. Great. <clears throat> Again, th <clears throat> thank you. The in, in the interagency, uh, every meeting that we go to in the Department of Defense now includes USAID. I think when I started uh, working in the policy around 15 years ago, um, they were, aid was not always in, in the room, and I think that uh, we have learned a lot of valuable lessons so that now at the lowest level meetings to the highest level meetings, <clears throat> the core uh, agencies are there, the Department of Defense. We have we also have the Joint Chiefs of Staff that are there with OSD policy. We have the State Department and the USAID as that core foundation for those interagency discussions. We'll talk a little bit later, I think, about the Stabilization Assistance Review. That's a clearly in D.C an area where we as three agencies have defined uh, stabilization clearly as a state lead, aid as the main implementer, and DOD is that supporting element. Um, I think that that work has gone on very well, and as Amanda said, there's three layers. The highest level is at that policy level here in D.C., that's where state aid and, and DOD uh, go to those meetings at the White House to talk about the policy. And then the program management of all programs, that second layer, uh, state and aid do that over at their uh, headquarters buildings. And then the third for DOD, we do that with the combatant commands and the, uh, that have those programs. And then in that third layer, as we implement things, we implement those through the embassies and aid development advisors. And uh, for DOD, we do that through the service components that are assigned to combatant commands. Army Africa, Marine Forces uh, Central Command. Those are the elements that uh, implement what our activities uh, out in the field. And again, I think that because of uh, what I talked about with having those 
agencies represented state and aid at combatant commands. We also have a lot of uh, subcomponent commands out in the field where we have state and aid representation. The communication, we were just talking before the meeting, the communication between state and aid and DOD is really great. Uh, sometimes with the communication within the Department of Defense, it's a little more difficult. They, they feel combatant commands feel more comfortable to talk to their state and aid counterparts in DC, but don't want to talk back up to uh, the Office of the Secretary of Defense because there's a military chain of command and they only want to go to the combatant command. So sometimes I get my best information from my state and aid counterparts. Um, so uh, if, that's, if there's anybody from DOD out there, you can remember that you can call D OSD once in a while. And that's my short answer for that. Thanks. Tom. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just to sort of build on what Mark was saying, uh, obviously there's a lot of coordination that goes on. Some of it is is facilitated by the National Security Council with their systems of uh, you know policy coordination committees and, and and so on, and that's very useful to bring us together to focus on a joint strategy, a joint approach, which is which is a big part of the the issue. I think the three Ds existed before, but they were sort of silos, and the idea now is is toward a more integrated approach. And I think maybe the best example uh, is perhaps AFRICOM, which of course was stood up uh, you know, more, much more recently than the others. So annually we have the Africa Strategic Dialogue that takes place here in Washington where the, the four-star commander of AFRICOM comes here, senior people from uh, the Pentagon, the Assistant Secretary for Africa from uh, State Department, the assistant administrator for Africa from USAID, and, and we sit around the table and spend a day just looking at the highest level issues and uh, goals that we agree on. So I've been on two or three of those myself. It's been very useful just to kind of come with a common understanding of what are the overarching challenges we're facing in Africa. Then, a couple of months later, we have a week-long series of meetings at the, you know, in Germany at the Africa Command where we bring together ambassadors, USAID mission directors, uh, and the, uh, the, the, the military folks to then drill down a little more kind of at, the, at an operational level of what are the big things that we're really focusing on with that overarching strategy and, and, and agreement on the challenge is, okay, what does that actually mean for us in uh, the region, in the sub-regions, and so on? And then, of course, then you take it down to the next level, which is a country team, which is led by the ambassador in each country, and then you're working at the tactical level. Okay, how do we coordinate these approaches within a given country? And so there, I think you have the most sort of filled out and, uh, and, and robust process of coordination that doesn't happen to the same degree in the other commands, but increasingly there is much more coordination through the, uh, the, uh, the senior uh, state and USAID folks at the, at the COCOMs to, to bring that together. And then, of course, with the big operations like Iraq, Afghanistan, that has a whole separate coordination mechanism that we work on. But it's uh, becoming much more robust. Uh, on a regular basis. Uh, so for instance, I go out twice a year to uh, Alabama to uh, the uh, senior leadership training there for the military to talk about how we coordinate. So we, we sort of triangulate it from a, a number of different ways. Thanks. Could I draw you out, Tom, just a little bit more, thinking about cultures yeah. And the, the very DOD and AID are almost opposite from one another mm -hmm. with respect to Department of Defense, very kind of top-down, hierarchical, the you know, kind of strategies developed at the top and percolates down, you know, kind of the, the system down to the operating components, as Mark was talking about. AID is the other way around. The, you know, kind of um, center of gravity, if you will, is, is in the field. It's the development practitioners mm -hmm. like those in, in the room and those who are out in the field now who are developing strategies and, and approaches and interventions and feeding them into mission directors who kind of feed them, them back up. So sometimes there's some kind of cultural 
mismatches, but I think those are worked through in the processes that, that you're describing. The, the question I wanted to ask is thinking about the AID mission director and the ambassador, the chief of mission on the ground from the State Department perspective. And those, those relationships at, at times can, can be challenging. And just to, to ask you about how that state AID uh, interface works with respect to the mission director for AID in a particular country and then the, the chief of mission. Yeah, and uh, those are a couple of different questions there. And, and it is true that you're working with really three separate cultures, uh, and each one is unique. Uh, and interestingly, there are commonalities that you might not expect between ones. So in some ways, I might disagree with you that USAID and DOD are so different. Uh, while we do have an emphasis at the, uh, you know, at the, the local level, uh, we're much less rank conscious, uh, some of those, you know, kind of uh, issues. On the other hand, we are very much about ends, ways, and means, okay, which is similar to the way that the DOD thinks, because we have specific, we have a, a pot of funding, we have, uh, you know, a specific strategy with goals and outcomes that need to be measurable somehow, uh, and, and, you know, you work out what you're trying to achieve, what resources you have, how you're going to use those toward a goal that has a long-term end, but you know, uh, interim steps along the way. And that's very common and, and understandable to the military in some ways more than with State Department, okay? Uh, on the other hand, obviously, we're working in a, in a different environment. Uh, and in other ways, we are much more linked up with State Department on political objectives that uh, you know, they have a policy role and we have an implementing role that we work together on. So uh, in a way, it's, it's interesting the, the dynamics of those three cultures and how we work together. Uh, it's it's uh, a fascinating uh, thing, but it's surprising how more and more as we've worked together, we understand the strengths that the other group brings to bear and that that is, it can be very helpful. Ambassador. I would, uh, would follow up on Tom's comment. Uh, first, I think we really are today uh, more critically interlocked in terms of development assistance efforts in the field than in Washington. And like Mark's comment, uh, we have far greater information exchange uh, with the combatant commands uh, at their headquarters, but most importantly in forward deployments than in Washington, and that's the way it should be. These are folks with the confidence of their respective command structures and authority structures working real events in the field. Now, of course, there is ultimate uh, guidance, broad parameters uh, set back here in Washington. Where there is a challenge over the literal numbers on availability of resources, how much money for which programs, when that's key, then the national security process is absolutely essential because no agency can determine numbers. It can determine how to ob monies when there is a debate over the monies themselves. And there, the National Security Council plays an absolutely critical uh, role. But once that's done, in my experience, this process really rapidly drops out of a Washington focus into a field focus, whether through embassies or in areas where we don't have missions, as in Syria where forward elements of the assistance community, the State Department diplomatic community, other agency presence, work with the deployed military in the field, literally in the field, to determine how best to provide not just post-combat stabilization, a phrase you'll hear very often discussed, but the kind of critical enablement measures needed while combat goes on. Uh, and that is a very real world real-time testing of here's the money available from the military, here are the boots and the fire support we have available. How do we put this all together in a way that maximizes, given finite resources, the outcomes we want to achieve? And it is a field-based process which we certainly attempt to impose minimal 8,000-mile uh, screwdriver application toward. A word about classic embassy aid coordination. 
where you're not dealing with a deployed military presence. You're dealing in a more classic environment of development uh, or civil society or democracy and government support. Um, there, I think, and, and I may have been fortunate in my aid mission directors when I was chief of mission uh, at my posts, but I think the coordination works extremely well because we all recognize there are metrics that have to be applied continuously and very limited resources. We have the Hill watching us. We have the executive branch watching us closely. If we can't demonstrate what outcomes are being achieved, the monies are not going to be there. And we have no qualms these days with telling host countries, we, not the Hill, we, the executive branch, are gonna trim the monies available for our programs in your country because you will not allow us to implement in a way that we feel uh, is appropriate and supportive. And countries that do are gonna get those resources that would have gone to you in the old days, there would have been an endless battle over my country account is never going to be diminished. My success as a human being is determined by the amount of dollars I've been able to get for my account, for my country. We don't talk that way anymore. And, and that's a very good and a very positive development. Uh, there is a greater frankness with host governments, with enablers, with our cooperants on the ground in these classic assistance areas uh, than I've ever seen before. And I think it works very well from the standpoint of defending to our ultimate customers, who aren't, quote, our countries, but our country and our taxpayers, where their monies are going. What I'd like to do now is um, cover two more topics and then open it up because I am confident that there are many questions and points to be raised out here in the, in the audience. I, I'd like to touch on the national security strategy and then the stabilization assistance uh, review that's been underway among the three Ds. The um, national security strategy came out at the beginning of the year, as, as probably everybody knows. Uh, if you're in the strategy business, you, you follow it really closely and it was a uh, quick issuance by this administration. Sometimes it can take a while for a National Security Council to get its act together and uh, produce a national security strategy. But the current administration came out with one uh, published in January, and a lot of the attention paid focused on the return of great power competition as the, the key theme. And th there was much more to the national security strategy than the great power competition theme, which of course was an important one. But in scanning through and thinking about this community that today and uh, the, the 3Ds approach, I went through kind of carefully to see what, what was in the national security strategy from, from that perspective. And, and there are quite a few threads uh, to mention, and I've, I'll, I'll tick them off just quickly and then ask each of our panelists for perspectives from an agency perspective on how the national security strategy is, is changing the way we do business. Uh, the NSS touched on countering corruption and its importance. Uh, there was discussion of operating in complex conflict zones, applying foreign assistance and support of stabilization, I think something Ambassador Sutterfield has already touched on, talking about modernizing development finance approaches, encouraging better governance, the rule of law, sustainable development had its place, and then the idea of committing selectively to strengthening states. And I think this also is getting after the idea of, of husbanding resources and applying them in contexts where you have outcomes that are, that are more obvious over time. But I'll, I'll keep going down to Mark at the end and, and work our way in this direction if that's okay. But the, um, sure. as, as the national security strategy came out uh, and was, was combed through, and obviously each of our departments and agencies participate robustly in the process of developing a national security strategy. But what, what, what did it mean for DOD? What has it meant for, for your part of the enterprise? Right, <clears throat> thank you. The, uh, the nor national security strategy, as, as you outlined, Amanda talked a lot about uh, large power uh, competition and then Followed closely behind that, we had the national defense strategy. And if you read the national defense strategy, that's even more clearly that we have large uh, power competition. And that's the core competency of the Department of Defense. 
But what is unique, I think, about the national defense strategy, it talks about uh, Defense Objective 4, enabling the U.S. interagency counterparts to advance U.S. influence and national security interests. And that's where I'd like to highlight, because that's, that directly affects the national security strategy. I think that over the last few years, in the last 15 years, we've learned a lot of lessons in Iraq and Afghanistan especially. And if you look at the authorities, the authorities that Congress gives to the departments they are different, and we have been given, DOD has been given different authorities in Iraq and Afghanistan because of the magnitude of, of what was going on there. And anytime you get special authorities, it always makes me r remind myself when I hear the word special, uh, is that a good special or a bad special? And I think we have to think about Iraq and Afghanistan and is it lessons learned or lessons encountered? And uh, for the Department of Defense and the new national defense strategy, that importance of enabling interagency counterparts. How do we, again, going back to the, we are the support team commander. We need to know when we're in the lead, and we need to know as a government when the Department of Defense is in the lead. But in many times, the Department of Defense is not in the lead and should not be in the lead. And there have been instances in the past uh, because of people trying different things and trying um, for all good reasons, that the Department of Defense has been given authorities that probably were larger than what were deemed to be uh, part of the Department of Defense before 9-11. If it, in 2000 uh, you had a discussion, what should DOD be doing, and then you had the discussion in 2007, people would be surprised that DOD was doing so much in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan specifically. And I point those out because I think we, we need to learn those lessons and we need to figure out where in DOD in in that in these large power competitions, if we are engaging a uh, foreign uh, enemy in, in a large competition, then DOD has a clear role in the lead in that military campaign. But if we are talking about many parts of the world where the Department of Defense is operating, we need to realize that we are the support team commander and we are supporting the roles of uh, state and aid. And I think that's to highlight a couple of those um, how that we have uh, worked and I think that we have learned these lessons to try to help uh, to provide that input the development of the national security strategy and the national defense strategy. Um, the issue of Ebola back in 2014. The Department of Defense sent 3,000 troops and spent $574 million in West Africa deploying to Senegal, Liberia, and, and uh, Ghana. Mostly in Liberia, Depart the DOD uh, supported the USG effort to say, we're going to focus on Liberia. And I just point that out that that's a large amount of uh, soldiers that were deployed for a health disaster, a pandemic, and it was uh, a two-star 101st Air Assault Division commander was reporting to the USAID Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, OFTA. They have a DART lead, a Disaster Assistance Response Team, a GS-15, so a two-star general was reporting to the GS-15 to explain all that uh, DOD was doing. And that normally doesn't happen in DOD realm, but it needed to happen, and it happened very well. And because of that great cooperation between the U.S. Ambassador, the State Department back here, USAID, OFTA, and main USAID back here, and the Department of Defense in the Pentagon and, and the whole way down to Liberia through AFRICOM, we were all on the same page, rowing in the same direction. We were supporting them. There were lots of things we did in Ebola where DOD was taking a lead role at first, and then we transitioned over to OFTA. And we were in, in September and out by April. So we did a lot of good work and built a lot of confidence, and we quickly transitioned to USAID. And I would like to point out another example of in Northeast Syria, as the ambassador al alluded to, the Department of Defense is supporting that less than uh, a dozen personnel on the ground. They're deployed under their Title 22 authorities. We didn't come up with a special authority. We, have, we can look at examples of what have happened in Iraq and Afghanistan where we decided, oh, all the state and aid people should work for DOD or people should work for the state. And we've kind of, right now we have people who are deployed state and aid are under Title 22 authority. DOD is under our Title 10 authority. For those of you who understand what that is, that's the authority that is given to us from Congress. And it allows us to work under our own authorities. We didn't come up with anything special. 
and we have a clear role where DOD is providing the logistics and the security and allowing state to do its, its job and its business, and they're not working for that general on the ground. But it requires a tremendous amount of coordination, and it happens all in the field. We just set up the policy here, and the great people in the field are doing the good work. So I think that's uh, just some examples that I'd like to point out of what we've learned, how we uh, put it into the national security strategy, and we can go from there. Thank you. Tom, how's the national security strategy impacted you? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, first of all, we were very much involved in the drafting of the national security strategy, you know, an integral part of that, and that, that was great. So a lot of that's there. And if you really look at the four pillars, USAID has a huge role in, in so many of them. Protecting the homeland, we're, you know, very much involved in helping to prevent violent extremism and conflict and, and uh, those bad actors that then can spread you know, to the US. Uh, Ebola is another one. So we were very much involved in that, as uh, Mark was just saying, so that it didn't spread to America. So in a way, we're protecting the homeland by those kind of things, uh, where it talks about uh, the American US influence abroad, working with State Department through the embassies USAID has a huge role in spreading the, the goodwill of America. It's interesting. I was just in Asia last week, and um, you know, obviously, the U.S. has a, a tortured history in Vietnam, going back to the Vietnam War. But what was interesting there is that the perception of, the, of America, there's a 70% positive attitude toward America among the Vietnamese and only a 7% positive toward China, okay? Uh, it's sort of maybe not what you would think, but a lot of that is through the work that we've done there since the Vietnam War, both military, diplomatic, and uh, a large USAID program, program, which, you know, is really helping the people there. So, you know, we can really spread a U.S. influence abroad through that. So there's a number of ways through those sort of... Uh, what you would think of as maybe just development, but it has a huge impact, I think, for our national security as, as a whole. And, uh, you know, the coordination, again, as Mark was talking about, more and more we work uh, in an integrated way, forward deployed with the military. Uh, a few years ago, many of you remember, when ISIS first spread in northern Iraq and took over Mosul, and Sinjar and the, the northern parts of Iraq, uh, there were a number of um, Yazidis trapped on the mountain top in, in Sinjar. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the military sent in uh, a small squad to the top of the mountain to see what we could do. There was a USAID person with the military that was little known, but that person's job was to look at the actual humanitarian needs of the group as well as the security needs. So we work more and more closely with that sort of, in, in a way, embedded, but with our role uh, clearly defined. Thanks. Ambassador, wrapping us up on the national security strategy. For state, the national security strategy, when it emerged in print, uh, did not represent a change for us. It was simply an expression, a codification of lines of action, lines of operation we had already been working on for many years. Uh, it's good to have it down in a formal fashion. That's important. Uh, but it was not transformative. We had begun the transformative process in the years that followed 07, 08 uh, in Iraq, Afghanistan. And I'd like to pivot back to, to Mark's uh, discussion of uh, northeastern Syria and to Tom's mention of West Mosul. In many ways, all three of us aid the defense establishment, the State Department, we're all enablers. We have, yes, specific leads in ISR, in fires support, in training and advising from DOD, in the actual technical administration of funds, the oversight, fiduciary responsibilities which aid uh, exercises, even in the field, even with minimal staffing and the diplomatic support which the State Department provides to all this. But in a very real sense, post-ISIS, West Mosul, the Nineveh Plains, 
and our province, all of us are enabling local actors, local military and security actors, local political actors, in some cases local assistance actors, to achieve a greater combined effect. And that is absolutely true in northeastern Syria. The US military is not and cannot, with 2,200 boots on ground, lead this fight. They're a supportive element, a vital one, to our partners in the Syrian Democratic Forces. What AID is doing, what state is doing, is similarly enabling and supporting what the SDF is doing, maintaining that platform that enables us all to be able to achieve a greater effect than separately could ever be done. And I think they're probably the two greatest examples of places where we have all adapted in this new and challenging world in a way that I think we're going to find replicated in many more places around the world. There are gonna be more examples like northern Iraq, northeastern Syria. We're all enabling other efforts, and not just by ourselves, but in coalitions. Coalitions whose focus may be a mix of military, political, diplomatic, or assistance support. Uh, that, I think, is, is the wave of the future rather than more classic, the US is in the lead, everybody else step aside. Uh, we're gonna take this over. Great. Let me uh, open it up. There are two microphones, which I can't, I think there's one here and one about there. Uh, and give members of the audience a chance to pose a question or a provocation disguised as a question. Those are acceptable as well, but it's not an opportunity to uh, you know, kind of make a speech, if that's okay, because we don't have that much time left. I would like to give Rube a chance who wants to uh, get up there. And I apologize, but I can't see you if anybody's standing there. And while people are moving in that direction, I will pose my final question. I held it back because I wanted to make sure to leave time for the audience. Uh, so in the last year or so, the, the 3Ds have been working on a refined framework for stabilization and reconstruction. It's been touched on a little bit, but I'd like to uh, ask each of you, as you look at the, the final product, um, to what extent is it, or is there anything revolutionary in there, or is it a kind of evolutionary capture of adjusting experiences over time as, as we've been hearing about in terms of deployed environments. And if you are kind of explaining it to your father or, or your aunt, you know, kind of what would you say is the, the big headline coming out of the stabilization reconstruction review? Mark, I'll give you first bite of the apple. I'll start off in the uh, stabilization assistance review. Uh, it, it's hard to believe, but it took us till the end of 2017 to define the word stabilization amongst three agencies. And it's, it's sad to say that, but, but it, it tells you that just, you know, coming up with a definition of a term and what the scope and scale of a stabilization means to people is, is important and hard work, but we need to do that. And, and so we define that. It's state is in the lead for stabilization. USAID is the main implementer and DOD has that supporting role. I think that's critical. Uh, it also says that it's a political endeavor. When we conduct humanitarian assistance, uh, that is a needs-based. Uh, stabilization is a political endeavor that we need to, as a government, determine who are we working with. Is it at a national level, a local level? But we need to define what that political endeavor is, and then we'll uh, work on the scope and scale of everything uh, that we do in the stabilization world. I think that are some of the most critical pieces for the Department of Defense. We have had great discussion over the last two years amongst the three agencies of how we do a better job and learning those lessons. Uh, again, we're trying to work forward and realizing that we have done things differently and special in Iraq and Afghanistan and we're trying to come up with a policy that, that we can implement in the next place that we don't know, as, as the ambassador said, we don't know where that next place we may go for stabilization, but we need to have a structure and a mechanism. We have a very good structure and mechanism for responding to, to, to disasters. When I talked about Ebola, that was a, uh, we handled it as a health disaster. Um, we're very good at disaster earthquakes, and we have a structure where that U.S. ambassador is in the lead with that off the dart lead that I just talked about, and uh, DOD supports that. On the, Complex emergencies were a little bit more of a pickup game. Every place is a little bit different. 
and what we're trying to do is just uh, structureize a mechanism for us to do that. When we talked about those handful of folks that we have in from state and aid in northeast Syria, that took the, the two agencies, state and DOD, and uh, three with AID, about nine months. It was to a political transition of our government, but it took nine months to get from when people said that sounds like a good idea to get them on the ground because it's it's hard to figure out how to to get all the processes in place. And what we need to replicate that. We need to work. We're working now with state and aid on a memorandum of agreement for future deployments and figure out areas where, think of where a U.S. ambassador may have an area in, in the future and he may have the, or she may have the, the northern part of that country is a difficult one where his, their aid development advisor would like to go up and, and uh, do some work, but the security situation doesn't allow it. If we have DOD forces in that country and we have a standing agreement and if the secretaries of state and defense agree and the U.S. ambassador thinks it's a good idea, then we can, again, co-deploy, have state and aid co-deploy with DOD for limited times and have a mechanism and a, a system to do that too. If they don't work for DOD, allow them to do their business and we are in that supporting role. I think that's a, a critical thing for us to uh, continue to work on in the future with as part of the stabilization assistance review. And again, it's hard to believe, but in, in 2018, we, DOD doesn't have a global stabilization authority. We don't have the ability to do stabilization activities. We can do it uh, under specific authority for uh, Afghanistan. We have a legislative proposal for a small pilot program for two years to give us the ability to, there are times and space where um, when we talk about a complex emergency, we're defeating an enemy, but in the same city, uh, and when there was a fight going on in Mosul last year, East Mosul was uh, at one state and West Mosul was still in another state. So, you know, there, even in one city, you can have an area where the major fighting is over and then you need to start working on the humanitarian assistance and the stabilization activities. And in the other part of the city, there's still fighting going on. So we have to have close collaboration, um, working together on how uh, we, we do the business of the government. And there may be times when Department of Defense, if we had a little bit of a stabilization fund, we could prime the pump. The larger pump is state and aid for their stabilization activities, but there might be times where DOD is on that ground in that critical phase. So I think that uh, it's the best part of the stabilization assistance review is we have clearly defined everyone's roles and uh, I think it will be more effective. Tom, just briefly. Yeah, just to build on it. In many ways, the Stabilization Systems Review is evolutionary, but it's building on lessons learned, painfully learned, uh, over the last uh, 10 or 15 years in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere. But there's a couple of significant things, I think. Uh, David uh, already alluded to them. Uh, excuse me, Mark. Um, one is a clear definition of roles. Mm -hmm. So that, because, yeah, it's great we're all integrated, but you've got to know who's doing what. Okay, and then that becomes very clear. And so that, that's very important. Secondly, that stabilization is a political endeavor. It's, as uh, Ambassador Satterfield was saying, it's not about building structures. It's about a political endeavor to build local capacity uh, with the groups you're working with. So that means you have to have a local partner that you're trying to strengthen. Now it does in some cases mean yeah, you're trying to get essential services, the water, the electricity running, maybe some uh, small-scale construction and so on, but it's essentially a political endeavor to support local organizations to stand up and, uh, and manage their own affairs. And, and that's a critical understanding of what stabilization is and therefore what we're trying to achieve and all the pieces, how they fit together toward a, a goal, and, and, and that's significant, I think. Um, following I exactly on what Mark and Tom just said, um, I would apply uh, beyond that certain absolute parameters. And they would be triage, focus on outcomes, time limited. If I had another four words available, it would be cold-eyed bottom lines. Funds are not available. The time for expending funds, even if they are there, is not unlimited. Stabilization needs to be as precisely focused for specific outcomes 
which are accepted as U.S. national security priorities as possible. We just don't have the space, the resources, the political time to do anything else. We need partners. We need to be able to show results. And the time available for those results is ever shorter than it was in the past. That's how you get any further time added onto your clock showing what you are doing. When you can point out as an assistance administrator, as a diplomat, as a military officer in the field or back here in Washington, how what that dollar spent is doing to advance, sustain, avoid derogation or deterioration in the achievement of a particular national security goal, you're golden. You can't do that, you're not. And you won't have much time to make your case or to sustain your case. The rigors of the process, the triaging, where do you apply limited resources? How can you pivot out of unsuccessful, non-developing programs to other programs that offer a better potential for success? You don't have much time for that. The pivot has to be very agile and very quick. That's what goes along with any stabilization policy in today's world, and frankly, I think it's a very good thing that those rigors are applied, but I cannot overstate the importance of being able to show throughout how the bottom line up front is emerging through expenditure, through presence of personnel on ground. You can't do that, you're not gonna have the money, and you're certainly not gonna have the time. The theme of failure is one in the business community now that's getting a lot of airtime about accepting failure, fail, failing quickly, learning from failures. I think there's a whole range of issues we could unpack there. But I see we have uh, someone with a question. So, sir, could I turn it over to you? Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, good. Well, I'm standing here and I look behind me and there's nobody standing, so I don't know if I'm doing something wrong. Oops. No, you're doing something right. Thank or, you for stepping up. Or, or is it because we have two people from the Department of Defense and State Department at the stage, so people are reluctant? <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see at the end of it. Uh, I, I'm going to just go through my notes here quickly. First of all, thank you to Sid for conducting this uh, uh, great conference. Theme is very relevant to, uh, to current global situation. So thank you for that. Thank you for the panelists. And uh, I have a clarification and a question, and uh, it is for Ambassador Satterfield. I Googled him very quickly as I walked to the stage here. Thank you for your tremendous work for the last 39 years. I mean, I looked, you worked all over the world. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, we talked about the three Ds, right? And uh, you also mentioned about Iraq. You mentioned Afghanistan. You mentioned Syria. You mentioned the, uh, I'll, I'll make this short, uh, you mentioned the infinite resources that were there in Iraq subsequent to the war. Uh, you also mentioned that we failed, and at the same time you mentioned that Iraq is at a better place in history than ever. Uh, I want some clarification there because at one point in the history of Iraq, which has got thousands of years of history, Baghdad was the center of culture and learning. So some clarification there. You also mentioned that uh, you know, as U.S. citizens, we are sick of war. Of course we are, all of us. But it's not the U.S. citizens alone that make, a, make, the, make the major decision there. There are interest groups that are engaged there. So, I mean, there's a lot of things to talk about. My, my question here, specifically, one clarification in the question is, was enough, the first D, the diplomacy, was enough diplomacy done? Are you satisfied with that before we went into Iraq and you've been spending thousands and thousands and hours and times and dollars and in, into the Iraq situation. So a clarification about where Iraq is and a clarification about whether we have used the first D enough so that other Ds are not required. Thank you. Well, we could spend the rest of this week uh, d discussing the last part of your question and books have been written to fill shelves on that issue. What I said was I believe the effective coordination of the three Ds, the instrumentalities that the U.S. brings to Iraq in the fight against the ISIS so-called caliphate and now post-kinetic defeat of that caliphate are as effectively structured, as tightly and tautly implemented 
as I have ever seen, and I think that is a success. It was not a reflection on Iraq, qua Iraq, but rather what we were bringing as a government and with our partners to the field was better done now than it had ever been done in the past in terms of outcomes, effectiveness, and, and also responsibility to the various taxpayer sets of the countries that are participating and funding in this. I try not to look back to the should we have done what we did in 2003 uh, question. That's a valid discussion for pundits. I'm more focused on what can be done today uh, to achieve more enduring stabilization, diminution of the potential for violent extremism, instability to, to return, whether that's in Iraq um, or elsewhere. Thank you for your question. I see we've got another one, uh, ma'am. Thank you, this is a really interesting um, uh, and very timely topic. My question is, when we talk about the coordination that's taking place, and we've talked about it a lot from a structure perspective, from an interagency perspective, from a policy perspective, my question is, how do you resolve conflicts on the ground when, for example, the time horizons that each of you have to achieve your missions are vastly different? So Ambassador Satterfield, you talked about time being your enemy. You needed to be quick, you needed to be efficient, you needed to show results. Uh, the outcomes that we seek in development sometimes operate on a very different time horizon. So I'm wondering when you're looking at how to successfully achieve your shared mission in country, how do you resolve conflict when it comes up? Maybe I'll let Tom start with that on the, the long horizon and then we'll bring in the, the short right. horizon. Uh, no, it's an excellent question, and, and uh, you know, to me, it's good to have a little dynamic tension. I mean, that's part of the, the point of having the three Ds, I believe, is that we each bring a different perspective, and hopefully we can use that different perspective to come up with a better outcome and, and a discussion. That doesn't mean that, the, of course, there aren't challenges at times. Uh, you know, going using the Iraq example, I know when I went out there in shortly after the invasion in 2003, we, from a USAID perspective, we said, okay, you know, let's put together a three to five year strategy. And we were told, no, we're only gonna be here for six months, so we don't need a long-term strategy. Well, obviously, <laughs> that <laughs> was a problem. Um, you know, but uh, that, that has to be a part of uh, the discussion at the country team level. That's the, uh, the, the role of the ambassador with the lead uh, you know, staff that he has to bring that discussion because there are always political objectives that we have that are often more short term. There's longer term development perspectives and I think that uh, that sort of discussion and dynamic tension can be a good thing uh, to bring to the table and to ensure that we're, we're thinking holistically about the issue that we're trying to address, that it isn't just a political issue, it isn't just a military issue, it isn't just a development issue, it's a combined uh, thing and we have to look at it from all those perspectives. I think, did the other two agree or want to add, add to Tom's point? One thing I would add, add to that is uh, there's always this uh, tension of uh, speed of war, speed of relevance, and then let's not rush to failure. So there's uh, always that, that healthy dynamic on the ground for, uh, uh, for the military and the uh, civilian counterparts. And uh, for the military, we have civil affairs teams and uh, sometimes uh, we look to uh, their expertise to be able to get out in the areas but then work closely back with their uh, aid counterparts so that we, uh, we see things holistically and we don't get an imbalance, that we don't, one DOD doesn't see something that we're not sharing with yeah, I might just pick up on that just to follow up. When I was in Ethiopia, uh, we had some civil affairs teams there, and so we would meet regularly with the DOD folks, the USAID, and uh, once in a while the, the ambassador would bring us in because we did have a slightly different approach. Okay, we were looking at, you know, obviously longer term, whereas the uh, civil affairs teams were looking, they were working in an area where we were concerned about the, uh, you know, extremists moving in. And so they had a slightly different goal, and trying to pull those together was not always easy. Uh, and, and so those are the kind of things that we, uh, you need to deal with at the country team level. The interagency diplomacy in addition to the diplomacy with, with uh, foreign partners. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. 
good. I think we have a question over here. Ma'am. Good morning. So I just want to echo my colleagues first and thanks Sid Washington and the three of you for consenting to participate in this panel. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity to skim that line, I think, between provocation and question. And I apologize <laughs> in advance. Um, we've talked a lot about some of the more traditional security themes, a lot of more traditional DOD themes, but I'm curious to hear your opinions on if there are opportunities to collaborate more in this space that we're seeing, if we call it response to disaster, response to increase in extreme weather events, response and preparation for climate change, however you want to frame it within the agency. But are there opportunities for interagency cooperation as we look at preparedness and response agendas? And what do you see that looking like? And what do you see the roles of the, kind of the three Ds in those scenarios? Thank you. That wasn't too provocative on the scale of provocation. So, the word, the phrase climate change can be uttered. <laughs> so, thinking about preparedness and, and prevention. So, you're, you're right, a lot of the conversation has been uh, in, in a conflict environment that's already underway. But, but you're saying, what, what are the possibilities when it comes to uh, prevention? preventive activities or, or both, preparedness? Both preventive and, and sort of response activities. I think we're seeing an increased need just because of the magnitude of the disasters we're seeing. We're seeing an increased need for kind of DOD to step in in response yeah. to these. We're seeing increased U.S. spending in these areas and sort of what are ways that we can work together to address these problems and prepare for these events before they happen to really in, on one level to protect our infrastructure investments um, as the U.S. to protect our trade routes, but also to really diminish human suffering and, and prevent disease out, outbreak and address a lot of these more sort of traditional U.S. aid humanitarian goals. Okay, very good. And what, what I'll do is um, with the order, I'm, I'm getting the kind of watch the time signal. So I'll ask Tom and then Mark and then the ambassador to both answer the question and then include any kind of final thoughts that you'd like to, to share with the group. So Tom. Thanks, yeah, no, a big part of what we do in uh, our disaster assistance is not only the actual response but developing capability within those communities that are prone to disasters, natural disasters especially, but even now uh, in, in other than man-made disasters, developing capability to respond and mitigate the, uh, them, themselves. So to me a good example was in the Philippines a few years ago, there was a cyclone that came through and caused a, you know, a huge uh, problem there. And so we came with a big uh, response and then based on our initial assessment, we also asked for support from the Defense Department. But we had actually already been working in those communities because they were low-lying in the path of storms. The Philippines gets uh, you know, hit by typhoons every year. So they had actually already built their capacity to a large extent. And so we were able to bring in additional resources but work through local organizations. And likewise, uh, the Defense Department had been working with the Philippine nat uh, National uh, um, Defense Forces, who then were also able to, to put their resources to bear. So it was a good example of a lot of preparatory work that we had done. They still will need help, but they're able to do a lot of that themselves. A uh, similar situation in Nepal with the big earthquake there where we brought uh, work but uh, a lot of support both from uh, AID and from the military but most of the actual work was done by the local organizations both government and non-government because we had been working with them for many years to develop their own capacity. Um, but uh, you know I think uh, as Ambassador Satterfield was saying the integration of our three organizations has, has really improved quite dramatically. Uh, that we, we aren't scared of each other anymore. We're not trying to, you know, uh, stay away from each other. Uh, sure, there's turf battles once in a while. Um, but in a way, like I said, I think that dynamic tension can be a good thing uh, to bring different perspectives to bear. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the problem is not only the, the time uh, differences, but frankly, funding and resources. You know, 
Uh, the military comes with a much bigger number of people and, and number of dollars, and uh, whereas the funding that State Department and USA would have is not only less, but it's often much more limited and, and uh, you know, restricted on how we can use it. Uh, and that's often a problem for us. And so working together with uh, Defense Department help us a lot there. But that also means we need to engage Congress. We need to engage other parts of the U.S. government to help them understand the importance of flexibility if we're going to be able to uh, operate in these environments. The world has changed in terms of what we're dealing with. Uh, there's now 65, 75, 65 or 70 million people who are displaced, either refugees or internally displaced. S when I started with USAID, 80 percent, 90 percent of our humanitarian assistance went to natural disasters. Now it's 80 percent going to man-made disasters, and they involve conflict. So you have security issues. You have they're much more longer lasting. You have to deal with a lot of bad actors. It's, it's a very different environment. And it not only requires that we each do things a little different, but that we coordinate more effectively uh, in a more integrated way because of the, of the nature of the, of the issues we're dealing with. Thank you. Mark, prevention, you. preparedness, right. non-conflict response. The uh, for preparedness, the Department of Defense has a small uh, humanitarian Assistance Fund. It's called ODACA, the Overseas Humanitarian Disaster and Civic Aid. It's roughly $100 million a year, and we can use that mill to sieve. We, we can use it in a steady state, or we can use it in a disaster after a disaster occurs. And uh, when we use that money, every time we spend it, we get it validated by USAID, either the development advisor in a country for a city state, along with the US, U.S. ambassador in that country, and then in a disaster, that dart lead. And for uh, disaster preparedness, in Nepal there was an earthquake uh, a few years ago. Uh, we had done some, put some ODACA projects in with the Nepalese military and in the, with the Nepalese uh, civil society, and that was actually very beneficial. And the relationships that the Marine Corps specifically built with the Nepalese um, we had a very, uh, the response, was the coordination, I think, actually helped. After Ebola, we realized we need to do more on the preparedness for those health crises, and, and not just for the health, but how do African countries in West Africa, how are they able to respond to a natural disaster or a health disaster? DOD spent some of the our ODACA money, and we made sure that we coordinated our activities for that preparedness, disaster preparedness or health preparedness with USAID beforehand. And lastly, and just in summary, I think uh, the coordination amongst the three Ds are, are very good. Uh, it's, we're trending in a positive direction. I know many of your organizations, when you think about the Department of Defense, you don't want to work with the Department of Defense in your field. Realize that the Department of Defense understands that. We, for us, the door is open. If you have a question or a need, you can come to us, but we don't want to intrude upon your space. And uh, our goal is to provide the security background um, to allow you to do your work because what you, the work you do is very critical and uh, it's also um, very important. So thank you very much. Only in DOD would a hundred million be a small fund, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, Ambassador, bring us home. Tom's reflection on uh, how things have shifted uh, in his AID experience. Eighty percent of the issues he deals with now are man-made disasters. That's absolutely true. The most complex disaster uh, in the Near East Bureau, one of the most complex disasters in the world today, isn't Iraq, it's not Syria, it's Yemen. Yemen faces, and it's entirely man-made, uh, the complex mix of terror, violence, tribalism, external intervention, external exacerbation of already profound domestic cleavage lines and sources of instability and violence, and on top of it all, and because of it all, a humanitarian disaster of, of truly epic proportions, ranging from the world's largest uh, single collection of cholera cases, uh, a number already over a million and due to go up, to a 75% of total population dependent upon feeding programs. There's nothing like Yemen uh, anywhere in the world. And any time you try to tease out one line of action, you run into all the other circumstances attendant. So what do we do? It's whole of government 
and whole of international agency coordination. We don't have people on the ground in Yemen in any significant number able to impact this situation. We, the US government. Even our military presence is exceedingly limited. So what do we do? We work with the UN. We work with the World Food Program. We work with specific humanitarian agencies to assure through our political and military work that the access is sustained to bring in commercial goods, fuel, humanitarian assistance. This is a major lift. It requires constant attention. We work through our military. I see uh, Joe Votel constantly, and he in turn sees his planners in Abu Dhabi, in Riyadh, so that what we're doing from a military facilitation side doesn't work against the absolute need to keep humanitarian space open and to avoid exacerbation through military steps, either reputational damage to the United States or exacerbation of the disaster on the ground. It is a constant balancing act, and it is never perfect. It's always affected dynamically and usually dynamically negatively by events on the ground. And then we have the Congress. The Congress watches this space intently. And the moment there is any indication that humanitarian access is being closed by any of the combatant parties involved, the Hill will act. And the Hill will act in ways that not only will negatively affect our ability to play in this situation as effectively as we can, it will damage our ability to sustain what else is going on in Yemen, which is a counter-terrorism, counter-Iran fight as well. So we have got to juggle any number of balls here. That's the new world that Tom spoke of uh, and is profoundly uh, apparent to all of us in managing the disaster, the complex disaster that is Yemen. Well, that, that, was, that sounded more like Sisyphus. You missed uh, the opening where we were talking about rolling the boulder up the hill and it comes down with, with conflict or, or natural disasters. But we also talked about the, the importance of the, the journey and starting over again, even, even when faced with adverse circumstances. And again, we'd like to thank all of the professionals here in the room who work in these complicated spaces day in, day out. Thank our panelists, thanks Sid Washington, and uh, please join me. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Ambassador Satterfield, Tom, and Mark for sharing your thoughts with us today. It was really actually very exciting to hear about how you are and plan to be continuing to work together. And I hope all of us in this room can be a part of that. Sid Washington, as many of you know, stands for the Washington Chapter of the Society for International Development, or SID. SID was founded in 1957 by Andy Rice who is also credited with helping to create the field of international development. Andy was a visionary and saw a need for people and organizations to network with one another and share information. Eventually, chapters of SID formed around the world, and ultimately, SID itself moved to Rome, and SID Washington remained in DC to become what we have here today. I'm pleased that we have with us today Stefano Prato, who is the managing director of SID in Rome, as well as Larry Cooley and Jean Gilson from the SID Governing Council. Larry and Stefano will both moderate breakout panels later this morning, so hopefully you'll get a chance to talk to them and learn about what SID is doing globally. But back to Andy Rice, our founder. Andy started the tradition of recognizing a young professional in international development long ago with an award. And each year at our annual conference, we present this award to an extraordinary young professional who has shown exceptional leadership, innovation, impact, and commitment in international development. This award was named the Rice Award in 2011 to honor the memory of Andy Rice after he died. Over the years, 
we have received increasing numbers of applications for this award and from more and more parts of the world. A few years ago, applicants came only from the United States. Thanks in part to social media, we now have a much wider reach. And this year, we received applications from a truly exceptional group of candidates hailing from 26 countries around the world, including Afghanistan, Australia, Bangladesh, Cameroon, China, Ethiopia, Guinea, India, Indonesia, Italy, Jordan, Kenya, Malawi, Malaysia, Mexico, Nigeria, Pakistan, the Palestinian territories, Samoa, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, Trinidad and Tobago, Uganda, the UK, and the US. So many of these candidates were doing such terrific things. And one thing I noticed was that quite a few of them were focusing on solutions for people in developing countries with disabilities. We had applications from people doing work for the deaf, the blind, the mentally ill, and more. This was so interesting to me because we had not seen this before. And I think and hope it may represent a trend around the world. In fact, we were so impressed with two such applications that we gave honorable mention to Melissa Diamond for her work as founder and executor of a global voice for autism. <laughs> Melissa is here today. <laughs> and also to Alan Odiambo for his work on behalf of deaf individuals as CEO and founder of Beacon Inc. And while Alan was unable to come from Kenya, he sent his colleague and co-founder in his stead, Pauline Guiteau, who will also... Right Pauline will also be speaking on our innovation panel this afternoon because independent of the Rice Award, Allen's and Pauline's submission to our innovation challenge was one of our five winners. We have a third honorable mention winner with us today, Davina Durgana. And Davina has done extraordinary work to measure modern slavery as co-author of the Global Slavery Index at the Walk Free Foundation. So I'd like to congratulate all three, which we've done. I'd like to congratulate them for their really important and impressive work and leadership in international development. Thank you. And now I will tell you about the winner of our Rice Award. A committee of six spent many hours going through the applications and discussing the candidates. The committee included Will Rice, Andy Rice's son, who is here today. Will reminded us that his father's passion was connecting people and with that in mind, we chose someone who is creatively connecting people to improve lives and solve an important problem in a sustainable way. Alpha Senin founded Y Farm, which stands for We Help Youth Farm in 2015. Based in Trinidad and Tobago, Alpha is using Y Farm to educate and engage youth in agriculture. His goal is quite simple, to expand the future feeders of 2050. And he does this through agri-edutainment. He created a superhero, Agriman, with a comic book, gadgets, a fan club, and more. He goes to schools, takes children on farm visits, and even held an Agriman birthday party at the request of one child. He says his primary objective is to develop a new generation of food producers by using innovative, creative, and attractive strategies to rebrand the culture of agriculture. Within two years, Y Farm had reached more than 150,000 people worldwide. Alpha describes himself as a Tribagonian farmerpreneur, motivational speaker, and agri youth advocate. He is passionate about his work, about changing the lives of young people around the world and about the future of agriculture. His vision 
creativity, focus on sustainability, leadership, and enthusiasm all stood out to our committee. And while we had hoped to have Agraman join us today, we'll have to settle for Alpha himself. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you the winner of the 2018 Andrew E. Rice Award, Alpha Senen. Thank you so very much, Catherine. Um, ladies and gentlemen, pleasant good morning to everyone. So one of the things that Catherine would have um, omitted was that um, I am an agriholic. <laughs> and I kind of have some special powers to convert people to agriholics. So be careful. It is absolute pleasure um, to stand here in front of you all today and be and uh, you know, accept the Rice Award 2018. I will first like to extend um, congratulations to my other young colleagues who would have you know, been, I would say, awarded as well. So thank you all very much and um, keep up the good work and congratulations. So yeah, it's an absolute pleasure to be awarded the Andrew Weiss Award for my work with YFAM. For young global entrepreneurs like myself, you know, th this means a lot. And, and what really matters is the appreciation that someone is appreci appreciating the work that you're actually doing and you set out to do. It gives you that energy and that burning fire to continue because we all know the road, you know, in development, it's, it's rough and it's tough. And it isn't always a a good and a happy day, you know, trying to work with young people throughout the globe. It can sometimes be very scary, but awards like these, you know, it, it, it really gives you that fire to continue. Having said that, you know, I must say thank you um, to the late Andrew Rice and Mr. Robert Berg for establishing what was formerly known as the Truman Award for their vision of awarding young professionals like myself um, in the work in international development. And who would have known that after all these years, when they first created this award, young people from all over the globe, all over all the countries that Catherine would have called, would be sending in applications to actually be you know, nominated for this award. While preparing this talk, I had to really ask myself, how did I get here? How did I reach the, you know, being on the stage to be awarded? And, uh, you know, it, it sort of started to me, started for me when I called one of my colleagues named Karen Bascom three years ago. And I said to him, what do you think about a superhero character for agriculture? What do you think about him? And, what do you, and I, I want to call him Agriman. You know, he started screaming on the phone to me. And I was like, yes, that is a good idea. And from that day on, you know, I asked myself, like, how did I then take it forward and take it further, launch toward all these countries over the world? How do I get young people motivated to do this? And the answer really and truly is, is that, you know, we didn't, I have the, the power to raise passion and inspire people um, through something that they care about and it's sort of igniting what they care about in them. Because many of them don't know that they had it in them, like myself. I started off on a farm as a child, and I hated it. As a child, I literally hated agriculture. My dad would just keep you know, pursuing it in me, trying to get me to do it, trying to get me to do it. And I eventually just gave in, and that passion started to grow as I realized the importance, and I realized why. So my, my you know, according to, according to, to what is important with, with, with young people today, we build this passion in them to ignite that fire worldwide. You know, we weren't able to raise a lot of funds just yet, but what we raised was passion. And this is what we are taking our work forward, and this is what is making us stand out. So when I get in front of a hundred and more kids, and I tell them that there must be an adventure, to encourage youth in agriculture. 
starting with a main character who's branded as the world's most powerful food provider. And then I sing to them, and I say, boys and girls, I'm the agri man. To feed the world is my master plan. If you plant one tree, you can eat for free. This will guarantee food security. <laughs> we realize that the problem is creatively, is creating youth engagement, and the solution is creatively engaging youth. What was needed was that we had to transform agriculture into agriculture and put that swag in agriculture and call it swagriculture. <laughs> but more importantly, my journey has been one of sailing on four ships. And I want to share these four ships with you all. These four ships are one, entrepreneurship, two, mentorship, three, leadership, and four, partnership. And as we move forward, I sort of combined these four ships and created or invented a new ship called development ship. And this all comes together to create a very powerful vessel that can sail any way around the globe. And in the words of one of my, my biggest mentors, and this is a message from my young colleagues who were listening to this and whatnot, you know, without commitment, without commitment, we, you, you will never start. And without consistency, you will never finish. So throughout my work, I ha we had to be very persistent, very consistent, and committed to what you are doing. The simplest idea can reach thousands of people all over the globe. And these are lessons for young people who work in development like myself. Finally, allow me to say thank you to my father for never giving up on trying to allow me to grow food and show me what, how you know, a simple backyard farm could feed an entire family. And it's because of his passion passed on to me that I'm now able to stand in front of you all today and receive this award. I also want to say thanks to my wife for sticking, it, sticking out with me and supporting me throughout you know, all this work. It isn't, it isn't easy, but you know, she, stood there, she stood by my side and continued to stay there. I want to say thanks to my brother for showing me how, you know, you can take and take, don't take a no as an obstacle, but take it as an opportunity. And this is something he always says to me, and it's important in my work as well. Um, last but not least, you know, a very, very important thank you to the Thought for Food Global Foundation, who have been supporting me throughout my journey, and the Kushner Group as well. And a special thank you to the Society for International Development for recognizing this very important work of myself and my colleagues as well too. And uh, you know, I want to say a, a special thanks in advance to all of you in the audience here today who one way or the other may want to work with myself and my colleagues. And uh, let's not study about the funds, but let's have fun. And um, most importantly, let's collaborate and not compete. Let's complement and not reinvent. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to say thank you very much. And I, I look forward to talking with some of you throughout the day. And um, have, a, have a great day, everyone. Thank you.